All right, so we are continuing in our relationship series, Secrets to Greater Relationships. We have this week, and then we have one more week. And uh, you getting anything out of the series yet? I guess not. Maybe, sh should I change the series or something? I'm not going to, so no. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but for those of you visiting, we open up typically with this declaration. This declaration gets our hearts ready to receive from God. God is always ready to do something amazing in our lives. So say with me, today, today I will hear the voice of God, the voice of God. Through, the of God. through the Word of God. My eyes will be enlightened, My eyes will be enlightened. and I will be changed. Now turn to your neighbor and say, I will be changed. Turn to another neighbor and say, I will be changed. Now say it like you really mean it to me. Come on, I will be changed. Awesome. Listen, I look at every opportunity, every day is an opportunity for transformation. Every time we come together is an opportunity for transformation because we serve a big supernatural God who's always ready to bring us higher. So since we are in a relationship series, I wanted to share something with you. Someone sent this to me, and I, I laughed pretty hard, and I thought, I, do you guys like to laugh? Okay, just want to make sure. So it says, I think women have a hard time to say, deciding what to eat because the last time they did, all humanity was plunged into sin and death. I thought that was kind of funny. I like it. I love when people send me stuff like that. It makes my day. Um, all right, so I want to open up with a story uh, that I read, and it says, at a Minnesota Dairy Queen last week, a blind customer pulled out some money and accidentally dropped a $20 bill. The customer behind quickly picked up the bill and pocketed it. Joey Prusak, the Dairy Queen server, saw what happened and directed that second customer to return the money. She refused. So Prusak expelled her from the restaurant and gave the blind customer a 20 from his own pocket. Isn't that cool? Appreciative customers alerted Dairy Queen management, and Prusak's story has gone viral. Why am I reading this story? This story reveals a picture of honor. And, and honor is something that we intrinsically know. It's something that when we see it, when we sense it, we know it, because it's a spiritual law that God has embedded in creation. And even when I say the word honor, there is a picture of a person that came into our minds. Isn't that true? Right? And, and I have found that people who walk in honor, this is a pattern I've seen, that they're, they're, in, they're never in want of a job. They're the ones that get promoted. They're the ones that seem to have favor that just follows them. Their relationships, they got some solid relationships around them. They walk in a peace. That is what I have seen on people who walk in honor. It's a spiritual law. And why am I talking about this? Because we're talking today, the title of the message is uh, Secrets to Greater Honor. And I have found this, and this is the, the, the foundation of this message in your notes. Greater honor brings greater relationships. Greater honor, greater relationships. And I think we can all agree that we all want to grow in our relationships. In fact, the reason why I know this is I, I read the prayer cards that come in. They all end up on my desk. And, um, and all, the, all the intercessors, they're prayed on throughout the week. And we pray again on them on Saturdays. But I like to look at them because I want to know the state of the flock. And um, there's, it seems to be that I could, I could say that all, the categories of the prayer requests have to do with relationships. Pray for this relationship. Pray for my husband. Pray for my child. Pray. Relationships. Finances healing, or then sometimes wisdom or direction. Those seems to be what people need prayer for. Relationships is a huge one. It's probably the most on all the prayer requests. We were created to be relational, to be in relationship. We thrive when our relationships are strong and solid. In fact, we'll even keep ourselves really busy with activity when we're not doing good in relationships. It's a big deal. And I have found that if we want to have greater relationships, we're going to have to grow in honor. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the definition of honor is honesty, fairness, or integrity in one's beliefs and actions. A person 
who is honorable, who walks in honor, they don't live uh, thinking about themselves. A person of honor lives by what they believe. And, and it's not like today where we have situational ethics where um, it changes based on this situation or that situation where it's more advantageous for me. Mm -mm. No, not a person of honor. It's about their integrity. If, if they believe something, if, if they think something's true, they don't change. So it's a person who's fair, who's honest, integrity, and then to give regard or respect to another. So in your notes, your first fill-in is, it's actually my first fill-in, it's your second fill-in, but just come on, bear with me. It's honor has nothing to do with feelings. Those feelings, they get us in all kinds of trouble, don't you think? Feelings are good. They're actually good, but they're not supposed to lead us. <laughs> That's the problem when we allow our feelings to lead us. But honor has nothing to do with feelings. It has all to do with what one believes, not what they feel. Boy, if I did everything I felt, I probably wouldn't be married today. Right? Okay. So the next feeling is this. When we live in honor, we think and do for others before ourselves. We think... And then we do for others before ourselves. Again, me is not in the equation when it comes to honor. And honorable actions, there's something that precedes honorable actions. And, and it's, it's actually a heart of humility. When a heart is humble, it's submitted, it's pliable, honorable actions will follow. And so when you are actually thinking and doing for others, there's this sense of humility in your heart that causes you to do honorable acts for others or to live honorably. In fact, Proverbs 15:33 it says that humility precedes or comes before honor. And you're going to want to memorize that one because we're going to be building on that particular scripture in a minute here. Now, when we honor people, we honor God. This is a big one, and I learned this early on when, when God was dealing with a lot of these things with me and my strong personality. Um, and there was this one, you know, did anybody in your first year or second year of marriage, did you have a couple of arguments? <laughs> anybody here? Did, did you maybe disagree? Yeah. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure before I share this because I don't want to be up here by myself. Um, so... I, there was this one time, I even forgot what the situation was, but uh, James and I were not agreeing on something. I was right. He was absolutely wrong. I just want you all to know that. <laughs> and he continued, um, you know, on something, and I could, I could feel the stuff rising up on the inside of me. Anybody have stuff rise up on the inside of you? And you can feel that it's coming to your mouth? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, so I could feel that it was just, mmm. And, and I, I said to him, I'm going to leave the room. Now, I still remember where I was standing. This is how real this was for me. I said to him, I'm going to leave the room now because if I open my mouth, I'm going to sin. And what I meant by that is if I dishonor him with what I say to him, with the manner that I speak to him, I understood I'm dishonoring God. So if I honor him, even if it's difficult, I'm now honoring God. And God says, if you honor me, I will honor you. So it's a huge thing. The way that we honor uh, people is how we're honoring God. Okay, got a little quiet in here, and that's all right. We're going to keep going because you do love me. You know that I'm speaking the truth. Okay. So there are natural laws that we understand that are embedded in creation, that are constant. God created natural laws as he created spiritual laws. He started the whole thing and put everything in process. And we understand that natural laws are constant. And all the laws of physics, even the law of gravity, we all know <laughs> that if you take a solid object and you throw it off a building, what's going to happen? Plop, it's going to fall onto the ground somewhere because it's a law of gravity. We understand that tides, they go out and they what? They come in. There's that law of seed time and harvest. These are natural laws that are embedded in creation. Let's look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. It says, while the earth remains, God created the earth, he set everything in motion, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. They are constant. They are natural laws embedded in creation. It's the same thing 
with spiritual law. They are constant. They are just as constant as natural laws. For example, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. A man reaps what he sows. It's just as constant as gravity. If we reap something, if we, if we do something good, we're going to reap that back. If we do something negative, we're going to reap that back. It's just a spiritual law, okay? Just, and it's just as constant as natural law. Look at the next one, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride comes before destruction. An arrogant spirit before a fall. It's just as constant as natural law. Pride will definitely destroy our lives. And the problem with pride is we typically don't know that we're in it until it's too late. And so that's why I'm going I'm to say this to every single one of you. We all need people in our lives, two or three people that know the good, the bad, and the ugly about us that can speak the truth to us. You need people to help you because you can't see everything that's going on in your life. You can't always see the setups of the enemy because they're so subtle. You think it's just you. But you need someone that loves you enough to call you out. I needed people to tell me, Tracy, you're in pride. You know why I needed it? I didn't want to be destroyed. Is there anybody here that would like to be destroyed? No. So this is a spiritual law that is just as constant as natural law. Look at the next one, Matthew 7, 2. For you will be treated as you treat others. So however you want to be treated, treat others. It's a spiritual law that's just as constant as natural law. And then I, found that I thought that this scripture was kind of interesting. Proverbs 26, 1. It says, honor is no more associated with fools than snow with summer, rain, or harvest. So honor and wisdom go in the same sentence, not honor and fools. You can't have honor and compromise in the same sentence. They work against each other. We will be a people of honor in Jesus' name. So now we understand that if I don't cooperate with the laws, natural laws, it's going to impact my life. So, for example, there's, there's the edge of the cliff, Grand Canyon, some kind of a cliff. You know, you kind of like, you kind of like walk a little bit towards away from it because you intrinsically know if I go over, there's no coming back. There's no redeeming that. Okay? We get that about natural laws. But we really don't fully believe that about spiritual laws. We believe natural laws more than we believe spiritual laws because a lot of times we don't see the effects of breaking a spiritual law immediately. Like we understand, boy, when you touch that, that hot stove and, and your hand gets burnt, you're not going to touch that stove again, right? For some reason, because we don't see the effects of breaking a spiritual law immediately, we don't believe those, are, those laws are as constant as natural laws. Are you following me? But they are. And those of us who, you know, a little bit older, live a little bit longer, we get this a little bit more. Because a lot of you, are, when I said you reap what you sow, those of you who are in my age category, you go, yep, that's right on. Because you've lived long enough to see that those laws, it happens. And some of you young people in here, I hope you're grabbing something today with this message. Because you can be spared so much by simply cooperating with God's spiritual laws. He created all of this. And listen, he's not going to break those spiritual laws. He's not going to break natural laws. He's going to let them all have their way. And you and I have the opportunity to cooperate with them or not. Amen. He doesn't force us to do anything, which is so amazing about him. So God created relationships. So if he, if he created relationships and the idea of relationships, shouldn't we learn from him? I mean, anybody who's not connected to God and writes a book or has, you know, is on a talk show somewhere, if, if, they are not created to the, if they're not connected to the creator, it's not going to be fully on. So we have to go back. What does God have to say about relationships since he's the one who created him? And if he created relationships, we should live by the principles that he said 
so that our relationships can thrive. I know that everyone in this room, you want your relationships to thrive, and they can. You are created to enjoy your relationships. I love how the word says, enjoy the wife of your youth. It's interesting that it says the wife of your youth, because you know, when you get a little bit older, it takes a little bit more work to enjoy. <laughs> but God's will for our lives is that we would enjoy our life. And when our relationships are thriving, it makes life a lot better. There's more confidence, more energy, more strength. That's just how God created us. Now, I want to unpack a portion of Scripture because I think this Scripture really shows you a picture of how to live in honor. And it's in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Uh, and it says this, uh, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And with all your soul, all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you need to understand something. When that lawyer was saying uh, the law of Moses, he's talking about there's about 600 laws in the law of Moses. And Jesus was saying all those 600 laws... You can summarize them in just two. And look, in Galatians, it says the same thing. In Galatians, it says the entire law, all those 600 wearisome laws is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, personally, I like things really simple. 600 verses two. I can handle two. How about you? Right? But these two, really, they do encompass everything. They encompass everything everything. Because really, if I'm loving my neighbors myself or treating them the way that I want to be treated, because that's basically what that is, there's no way that I'm going to lie to my friend or my coworker because I wouldn't want to be lied to. I wouldn't steal from someone because I wouldn't want someone to steal from me. I have been stolen from. I had someone rob, rob me right from my car. I felt so violated. Like, how could you do that? So if I, really, if I really treating others the way I want to be treated, there's no way I'm going to flirt with your husband because I wouldn't want someone to flirt with my husband. I really don't like it when anybody speaks to me in a demeaning way. So I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to speak to you in a demeaning way because I don't want that done to me. I, I really don't like it when someone just gets angry and goes off on me. So, so I'm not going to do that to you. Are you following me? Yes. Boy, wouldn't the world be a lot better if we would just follow one? Treating others the way they want to be treated. In your worship guide notes, when we love our neighbor as ourself, treating them the way that we want to be treated, we are living in honor. Amen. Remember, honor. Secrets to greater relationships is honor. It's honor. Now, I want to unpack a portion of Scripture that kind of puts all this together in regards to honor and even it's going to build a little bit more. This portion of scripture is from the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could not dwell in humanity because Jesus had not yet come down on the cross for our sins. So there were prophets that the Holy Spirit, the prophets, the priests, and the kings, the Holy Spirit would come on them in power and they would, they would prophesy and things of that nature. But there were two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. They're known as to be these great prophets. And these great prophets, these two, were extremely honorable. But what makes them different than a lot of the other prophets is they operated in miracles. So Elijah, there were 16 noted miracles. Elisha, there was double those miracles noted. And then we find in the New Testament, Elijah, one of the greatest prophets, he shows up with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, those are Old Testament prophets, show up with Jesus. He's glorified. James, Peter, and John, they witness this whole thing. They don't know what to do with themselves. So these are two very powerful prophets, very honorable, and they walked in miracles. So I want to pick up in a story from the Old Testament where there's this commander He's a very, very famous commander, decorated commander, not from the Israelite nation, but from the Aramean nation. He has leprosy, and he finds out from his wife's maid that there's a man of God in Israel that can heal him of le leprosy. So we're going to pick up with him actually going to visit Elisha. And it says, 
So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Then your skin will be restored and you'll be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became very angry and he stalked away. Well, I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call in the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farpar better than all the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? Really sarcastic. So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him, and they said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, Go wash and be cured. So Naaman, he listened to them. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him. And Naaman said, now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And that's the purpose of a miracle, to bring glory to him. It's not just about us. It's about bringing glory to him, that others would be so blessed by it as well. So please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. And though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elisha refused. And there's a reason why he refused, because there are other times, if you study his life out, that he did receive gifts, and we're going to see why. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master should not have let this Aramean get away without accepting any of his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. Now, Gehazi, it says, was the servant of Elisha. Now, Elisha at one time was the servant of Elijah. When Elisha became Elijah's servant, he left everything. His livelihood, just, just literally forsook everything. And he, he literally came under the tutelage of Elijah, served him, honored him. And Elijah was actually training Elisha to be the next prophet in Israel training him to operate the same way he did in tremendous power. So Gehazi is what Elisha was to Elijah. Are you following me? Okay. Could it be that Gehazi was in training to be another great prophet who operated in tremendous miracles? So what does Gehazi do? As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi sent, set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed down from his chariot and he went to meet him. Well, is everything all right? Naaman asked. Yes, Gehazi said, but my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give to them. Lie, 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 lie. Okay. By all means, take twice as much silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants to carry the gifts for Gehazi. But when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from his servant, sent the men back, then he went and he hid the gifts inside the house. Oh, he's sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Okay. When he went to his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? I haven't been anywhere. But Elisha asked him, don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? What, what was going on? The spirit of God, like in a vision, he was right there. He saw the whole thing happening. And that still happens today. That, that, that is a gift of the spirit that's still in operation today, but it's even more so today. Uh, many years ago when my brother was still a teenager, um, my mom is a prayer warrior, and uh, she was praying and one night when he went out, and she did that a lot. And, and I just want to say this, that my brothers and I, we came to Christ about six months after my mom came to Christ, and we were extremely rebellious. 
extremely rebellious. And I, and I, I say this to hopefully give some hope to some of you parents. If my brothers and I could get saved, anybody could. <laughs> we were just, we were, we were bad. Ugh. So anyways, so my brother comes home from being out with his buddies, and my mom stops him. Now, my brother is about 6'1", my mom's 4'11". And she looks up at him and she says, I saw you at such and such place and you were standing in a kitchen and you were surrounded by a bunch of people and you had two pitchers of beer in your hand and you were drinking from this one and you were drinking from this one and you, and you said this and you did this. And then she described some other things that he was doing that she, there's no way that she would even know what they are. And you'd think that he would have repented, right? No. You know what he says to my mom? Why do you keep praying for me? It took quite a bit for, his, for him to finally get broken and realize that that prayer was to spare him of destruction because he was going down a path to hurt his life. And obviously, he, 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 uh, he's not doing that today. He's a great man of God. So I said all that to say, let me finish the story, and then I'll give you my point. Is this the time? This is what Elisha said to Gehazi. Is this the time? To receive money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep, cattle, female and male and female servants. What was he saying? Gehazi, I've been training you. I'm needing you to be like I was to Elijah. God wants to work in signs and wonders and do amazing things for you. And I'm trying to train you. But you decided to grasp for something before it's time. You decided to be dishonorable. You didn't trust what God was doing in you. Because you've done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was as white as snow. He actually forfeited his own destiny because he chose to be dishonorable. Why am I saying all that? I love patterns. I see patterns in the Word of God. And both Elijah and Elisha were very honorable and operated in tremendous miracles. Then you have Jesus, Jesus who operated in tremendous miracles. In fact, when Jesus was operating in the earth, they thought that he was Elijah. And then you have the church after the Holy Spirit descended on 120 at Pentecost in the upper room. The church got so empowered with the Holy Ghost and, the, and began to operate in miracles. And it wasn't just 120, it just spread. That's how the church was built. But then you have church history where you no longer see miracles. Right? And I found the pattern. You see, there's two things that surround revivals or a miraculous, or how about this, a breakthrough season. There's two things, prayer and honor. And when I studied it out, even past revivals, I've spent years studying revivals. How the, how, and, and revival is when people come back wholeheartedly to God, and it's, it's, it's laden with signs and wonders and healings and miracles, those kinds of things. And I've always been intrigued by it. So I found that when a group of people would continue to pray and commit to honor, watching how they talk with each other, being in unity, revivals would remain. The minute prayer stopped, honor stopped, revivals would wane. Isn't that interesting? Could it be that honor was the key? I think so. Think about this. The early church was, what, 120 people started, right? And now we have all of these different denominations because somewhere along the line, someone decided to do things their way. Right? So with honor, so you've got, in your notes, it come, it's first humility. Then next comes honor. Then next comes miracles. Miracles f- literally follow honor. They follow honor. And the reason why I believe the Lord put this on my heart, because of, in, at the end of December, the word that we received for 2019, that he, which he, where God said, prepare my people for greater manifestations in their everyday life. Could it be that honor's the key for you to experience God's supernatural in your workplace, in your families, in your schools, in the universities, in your interactions? Is, it, is, is honor maybe the key? I think so. I think it's a big key because we definitely are a praying church. But I think God's saying, come on, I want you to come up on some levels in this word called honor because I'm fixing to do some amazing things. And guess what? We get to be a part of it. 
We get to be a part of it. So how, how, how can I honor? In your worship guide notes, I won't get offended. I won't get offended. This is a big one. And it's so funny. I was just talking to, to somebody in between services, and she was saying to me how she was at work, and there was a sales representative that was working with her that just laid into her for something, and she could just feel that offense rising. Never happened to you, has it? Where she, you know, she wanted to fight back, and she wanted to say some things, and she could feel it all rising up. And um, she, she ended up going into, you know, she went to the Lord, and she said, Lord, I'm having a hard time with this. She just wanted to, she, if she could crawl out of her skin and do something, she would have, right? And she went, and she said, she said, within 10 minutes of just talking to the Lord and saying, I need help. I, I, I could feel this taking a hold of me. She just said, help me, God. She said, within 10 minutes, that thing just lifted off of her. Nothing changed, but the Spirit of God came to the rescue to help her. And that's for anybody. We don't have to walk offense-free in our own strength, in our own willpower. We have the Holy Spirit. Look at this scripture. It says, avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Only fools insist on staying offended. And we have these words that mask offense. Well, I'm just hurt. No, you're offended. And, and offense, the reason why I'm saying I will not be offended, because when we're offended, I'm in the, in the equation. Somewhere it's about me when I get offended. Come on now. I wasn't heard. I wasn't acknowledged. You know, it, this plan is the best plan. Why aren't you listening to me? Oh, that was me. That was me. I, 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 when God was teaching me a lot of these things, there was this one particular meeting that I was in. It was a staff meeting. I'm talking this like 20 years ago. And it's amazing. That those moments where God was teaching me things, they're like, it's like it was yesterday. I'm sitting in the staff meeting, and I've got the plan. I spent all night working on the plan. I'm pretty excited about the plan. In fact, the plan and I are one. You can't even separate the plan from me. That's how one I am with it. So I'm presenting this whole plan, and I'm so excited about it, and I'm, I'm not seeing agreement on anyone's face. Excuse me. In fact, they start saying, well, I don't think it could work. I, I don't think about, and I don't, and this is not going to work. And I, I, I could feel, how dare you? And not because I wanted to be right. I was fully convinced that that was the right plan to save us. So sometimes we get in offense because we really are convinced that's the only way. We just need to take a pause and say, no, it isn't the only way. And right in the middle, I could feel all this stuff rising up on the inside of me, right? I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, push away, Tracy. Push away from the table. And I can remember, you know, we had those, one of those, those chairs that had little balls that roll. And I remember just pushing away. And when I pushed away, it's like immediately the Holy Spirit showed me that what they were saying was so right on. It was to, it was to bless the plan. They weren't tearing it apart. They were trying to make it better. And he showed me that I needed them. Ah! I couldn't do it by myself? No, we need one another. So when we get offended, I'm in the equation. And honor is not about me. It's about others. All right? So the next one, I, I refuse to lie. Another big one. We have all kinds of reasons and excuses why we lie but the number one reason why we lie is because we're trying to preserve ourselves, And that's why lying is about me. It's not about others. And honor is about others, not about me. Okay? Next one is I will live as an open book. And here at Grow Church, we talk about transparency a lot in our, in our staff and our teams, about being transparent. When you are transparent, it is the most freeing way to live. I think it's a lot of work to have to keep up pretenses. I mean, I used to get really tired. Anybody here? And you know why we do that? Why that? Why I've got to be this way in front of you, but I'm different at home? Because I really am not so cool. Uh, I don't think I'm all that, but I want you to think I'm all that so that it'll help me think I'm all that. I don't even know how I said all that. right? It's actually freeing. It's, it's, it's a form of trust when we say, I'm going to live 
as an open book, I'm going to be the same person all the time, whether I'm at, at my house, whether I'm at work, or with this group of people. I'm just going to be the same person, open and transparent. I'm not going to be the secretive person that has this little private life. Anything that's done in secret is usually going to hurt you. Look at this, this spiritual law here. It says in Mark 4.22, for everything that is hidden will eventually be brought out to the open. And every secret's going to be brought to the light. It's going to happen. It's a spiritual law. Right? So, and when we have those things hidden on the inside and all that going on, if you could just see, it's almost like there's a hook that the enemy has right in your soul. Just to keep you where he wants to keep you. And even when it comes to lying, did you know that the scripture calls Satan the father of lies? And, and early on when I was learning this stuff, I remember the Lord saying that when you lie, Tracy, you're aligning yourself with the father of lies. You're collaborating with him. Is that really what you want, Tracy? No, I don't want that. So, next one. I will think of others before myself. If I'm going to honor, I'm going to think of others before myself. In other words, I'm not going to insist on my own way. I'm going to take a minute to put myself in their shoes and try to get past my own personal hurt, my own personal stuff, and give myself the opportunity to see from their perspective. We need to do that, don't we? We're so quick to judge, so quick to come to conclusions without taking a minute. Let me just take a minute. I'm trying to put myself in their shoes, okay? Proverbs 22, 4, it says, True humility and the fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and long life. Spiritual law. Is there anybody in this room who would like some long life? Anybody want some riches and honor? It's a spiritual law that follows humility. And, and, and the fear of the Lord, I said, it, I said this last week, it literally means reverence. It's, I recognized how awesome you are, how much you love me, how you really want the best for me. And so because I've recognized this, I'm coming under your way. I'm reverencing you over what I want, over what I think. And the scripture says that when we humble ourselves, we have the reverence of the Lord, riches and honor and long life follow. It's a spiritual law. It's a spiritual law. And to treat others the way that we want to be treated, it's a spiritual law. You're coming under. Your feelings are saying, no, I want to do this. But then you say, no, I'm going to do what he said is my created design. I'm going to come under, and I'm going to live in honor. The last one, I will think about what I'm going to say before I say it. This is a big one because I think the greatest dishonor that we do is what comes out of our mouth. Just maybe we need to just pause, especially when you're in a heated conflict and someone is saying something that's rubbing you the wrong way. Just maybe I need to literally get some duct tape just for a minute and think about how can I, how can I respond? How can I engage in this conversation? How can I say this in a way that's truth but still honorable? Help me, Holy Spirit, to separate my feelings right now so that I can open my mouth and still be honorable. I think we dishonor so much with the things that we say because we're not taking the time. Okay, help me, Holy Spirit. Scripture says to be slow to speak and quick to hear for a reason because he understands our emotional life and that people are going to rub us the wrong way. And it's amazing that a lot of times it's those that we're, that we're the closest to that we have a tendency to dishonor with our words. And you may not realize this, but when we dishonor someone with their words, they are literally seeing the value that you place on them. It's not good. So, I believe that God is saying something to grow church. He wants to do amazing things in our life. And could it be that it begins with honor? I think so. I really believe so. Secrets to greater relationships, greater honor. Greater honor. Secrets, secrets to greater manifestations, greater honor. Greater honor. I want to pray with you all. Could you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? Bow your head and close your eyes. It is impossible to walk this way without 
having Jesus living on the inside of you, without having the Holy Spirit, this wonderful gift dwelling on the inside of you, you're just going to go in circles. You will not obtain your destiny without a vital relationship with Jesus. And Jesus does not push himself on anybody. He waits to be welcomed in. That's just what he's like. And when we welcome him in, he graciously gives us his Holy Spirit to dwell on the inside of us, making us born anew. Everything changes after that. It is the greatest miracle. And maybe you're here and you've never done that. You've never prayed the most powerful prayer ever, which is to invite Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and to be your Savior. And I want to pray with you this morning. It's a simple prayer, but it changes everything. So if you are here, and, and you know your heart is just beating in your chest, you know that this is your day to surrender your life and receive Jesus. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you want to be included in that prayer? Quickly raise your hand right now. Say, that's me. I need to be born anew. Bless you. Bless you. I need to receive Jesus. Bless you. I see that hand. Bless you. Bless you. Oh, it's the greatest miracle. Maybe you're here and you're just, you've prayed that prayer, but you're far away from God. You know that he's your savior, but you know you're far away. He's not your Lord. You've been doing life your way. And you know God is telling you, come back. I've got an incredible life for you. If that's you, you want, you're ready to recommit your life to Jesus. Quickly raise your hand. Say, that's me. I see that hand. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Jesus. Jesus. You're so good. You're so good, Jesus. Praise you. Now, I'm going to pray this prayer. And just pray it after me. Mean it with all your heart. And let the Holy Spirit into your heart and do what he does best. Deliver. Set you free. Make you new. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. For dying on a cross for me. I surrender my life to you today. And I invite you into my heart to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Now, I believe, oh, with this simple prayer, I am a child of God. Your spirit is in me. I'm born in you. Now help me to live for you all the days of my life. Amen. I want to continue to pray. I know that this was every head bowed, every eye closed. This was a pretty interesting message. I guess that's the way to say it. It causes us to, to check our hearts. And if in any way you're feeling condemnation, that is not from God. That's from the pit of hell. God is saying to you, come up higher. I'm not holding anything against you. You are forgiven. Listen, we all miss it. That's why there's his grace and there's his forgiveness. So this is not the time to beat yourself up to allow the enemy to win today. This is the time to receive forgiveness and then make a decision to honor. When you make the decision to honor, now you're actually inviting his help to do it. And I want to just pray a corporate prayer for all of us, over us, that we're going to be a people that will honor and reflect who he is. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, this is the decision we're making. We want to be a people of honor. And we know that we cannot do it in our own strength. So this morning, we're receiving from the power of your spirit to walk out what our heart burns to do in the name of Jesus. By faith, we receive that grace to represent you. And Lord, we have an expectancy of favor and greater manifestations to follow our lives that we could represent you more and more to a world that's hurting and dying. 
We believe, we receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, come on, let's just take a minute and give God some praise. Glory to God.